Let's give it up for our guest, the Bull, Greg Luzinski. How about it? Thank you. 1980 doesn't happen without this man, for sure. So I, uh, I wish Ed was here, but uh, he, uh, he elected to go to the Sixer game tonight, so I can't even thank him. But Ed and Nikki, um, the owners here at this fine establishment, I want to thank them. Um, but first and foremost, um, they, they slipped on in under the, under the uh, radar here. City Distillery um, is in the house. Um, if you're over 21, they're buying a drink for everybody. Um, so you can, uh, you can check out those folks. Go over and chat it up. They're a local distillery. They're about a mile from here. And, and I'll be honest with you. These, uh, these little goobers right here are going to do real well this summer, real well. So there, there's a winner right there. So we're, we're uh, very appreciative they're in the house tonight. Um, so uh, go over and chat it up with them. they got a tasting room. They're open to, for, to go drinks. So what more can you ask for? So uh, give it up for Distitty, City Distillery right over here. Uh, we've got we've got a lot to go over tonight, and, and uh, I just want to make sure that everybody's on board with the uh, raffle items. You get some free tickets. Go over and see Sue. Uh, we're going to be uh, raffling those items off, I believe, at the end of the first quarter of the uh, Sixers game. Which uh, I, I heard one gentleman doesn't doesn't like the chances for the uh, Sixers tonight. So I. I'll pretend, I'll pretend I didn't hear that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he's sitting to my right. He's got a blue shirt on. Um, anyway. No job. Um, Not me. <laughs> Mr. Oh. Fandle. Mr. Fandle. There goes my account. <laughs> but anyway, a uh, couple more of our sponsors tonight. State Farm Insurance right here in Northeast Philly. Uh, Philip Yon. Uh, Abramson and Denenberg, law firm out of Center City, Philadelphia. Uh, and, and of course, Dagwoods for having us. Um, we're, we're back after 15 months. 15 months, so we're, uh, we're, we're all anxious to get, get back uh, on the road. Um, and no better, no better guest to, to kick it off than, than Greg the Bull Luzinski. So let's give another uh, round for, for the Bull. Thank you. Well, let's get to it. So I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to mix words. I'm going to dig right into this controversy with Major League Baseball. What do you What do you, what are you thinking? Well, you're th you're talking about the pitchers using uh, substances on the ball. Uh, ever since I've known, they they've done that. I mean, some of them actually scuffed the ball. I mean, Tommy John was probably the one of the best. That uh, somewhere, nobody knows where the ball was scuffed, but we used to collect them when they went foul. Danny Ozark used to put them on the st top step, and there was a, a couple dozen of them, but uh, nobody ever caught them. As far as uh, what I think as a hitter, I think you just create another pitch for them. When you start worrying about the ball is, and they're using whatever they're using, spider, spider tack or whatever, you know, you know that. That's not good as a hitter. It gives them another. It gives you mentally another something else to worry about. You know, it's tough enough to see fastball, changeup, curveball, and uh, slaughter with without worrying about a tacky ball. Plus, it gives the pitcher confidence more. Well, yeah. you know, you know, they're they're bitching about spin rate right now. Uh, you know, I, I I shouldn't probably say this, but in in the uh, older days, they they used it. I mean, we had a Hall of Famer in, on our club, uh, Steve Carlton. He used a little tacky substance. You know, he used it before he left the dugout. And he went to the mound. I mean, he never took anything out to the mound with him, but but he he used it a little bit, and it was all part of the game. And I and I think somebody uh, made a comment today that you can use rosin, which is on the back of the mound, and you can combine it, and you see them take the rosin and put it on their wrists and their forearms and everything. And with the sweat, it makes it tacky. 
So how how you how you going to stop that? And also was and I, yeah, and also was mentioned that uh, the hitters use pine tar, and and we do. And and uh, Manny Moda sticks they use now, which is a very sticky substance. But you know what? I, I think they're worried about the wrong thing. I I think they need to worry about developing hitters in the game of baseball compared to worrying about what the pitchers are doing with spin rate and and how hard they throw and everything else. I mean, you know, you take the shift for example. It's taken a lot out of baseball. You know, why can't a guy hit the ball the other way? I mean, I, exactly, and I and I think you know that that that's a big thing in baseball now is you know why worry about the sticky substance when you need to take the shift out of baseball and make a rule uh, to to where hitters can uh, hit for a higher average. I, I uh, use the example, say uh, Ryan Howard. You know, Ryan Howard was a 300 hitter for most of his career. What happened? When the shift came into play, he hit a lot of balls to, to, to the right side that would have been normally hits like three years before when he broke in. But then when they start shifting on him, they were outs. So now all of a sudden, instead of hitting, you know, uh, close to 300, he's hitting uh, 250. And everybody's going, what's wrong with Ryan Howard? Nothing's wrong with Ryan Howard. They, you know, the shift took it away from him. So I think it hurts baseball offensively. Any questions? Anybody have any comments? Anything for, for the bull that you'd like to add to this while we're talking about uh, sticky substance? Yeah, there you go. You can put your you can put your uh, drink down for a minute. We got a mic. We can pass around. If you got a question for the bull, I'm sure he's got an answer. Okay. You got, you got a few on Facebook, so we'll start there. Okay. What was your favorite part of playing? Well, believe it or not, uh, everybody probably would think I'd say Wrigley Field was probably my second, but uh, I used to enjoy uh, going out to Los Angeles. Uh, people used to come to Los Angeles and uh, watch batting practice a lot. That's probably the only place in, in my entire career that I got a standing ovation for batting practice. <laughs> you know, and, and I used to love it. Uh, you know, they, they had special nights there, like the Hollywood Star, Stars Night where... Uh, uh, what's his name came out to, to uh, Rob Reiner came out there I forget what they call him uh, on his TV show but uh, he came out there and he took a he took a lot of pressure off me shagging balls because he never caught one <laughs> but uh, I used to love LA I, I you know how can you not like it you know I know that some of the fans show up there late now but when I played uh, you got 35 to 40 thousand people in there a night and, uh, you know, it gets your adrenaline going when uh, you get, have a big crowd. I mean, you know, all these, all these players, you know, say that the, the fans don't matter. But, uh, you know what, I think it mattered. You know, you look at the Philly series this weekend when they played against the Yankees and we had over 38,000 people there a night. You know, you could feel some of the adrenaline in there. You got back to the old times, uh, the 208, the 209, even before that when the ballpark opened. To where we were selling out every night. I mean, I mean, the energy in that ballpark was really creative, whether it be a Phillies fan or a Yankees fan. And the players actually, you can feel that on the field. And I, I'd rather play in front of, you know, a full house than go to Cleveland, where when I played in the in the American League, there were two to three thousand people there. I mean, there, <laughs> there was nobody there, so it was like, what am I coming out here for? But you know. Uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of excitement over the weekend when the Yankees were there, and, and uh, obviously it was even better because we swept them. Right, and, and the Bats woke up. Too. Yeah, they woke up and they went to sleep when they went to the coast. Right. <laughs> they're, they're still on Eastern time. I guess. The Bats are anyway. Right. Yeah, the pitching's been good. Yeah, we've gotten some good pitching from our starters, and obviously uh, today Wheeler goes against uh, Kershaw, which is a, a great matchup yes. in, in the game of baseball. So, uh, you know, we got a couple guys that are, you know, probably are hurt. I haven't heard the latest on Bryce Harper or the second baseman Segura. I mean, you take those two guys out of the lineup, and it puts a lot of heat and pressure on the rest of our guys. Exactly. Exactly. That's hurt. That's for sure. So, uh, who gave you the nickname, the Bull? You know, uh, nickname the Bull came in the minor leagues, but uh, it came it came from a, a rider who has uh, passed away, uh, Bill Conlon. And uh, when I came to the big leagues, I did a 
I signed in 68 and I, and I did a workout in Wrigley Field. And I, I had a, a great workout there after I signed and uh, did a, L. Widmeyer, the old coach, pitching coach, was the pitcher. And I hit a lot of balls out of the ballpark or into the seats there in, in Chicago. And uh, that's when he nicknamed it. And it was a nickname that stayed with me. Uh, there's been a, been a lot of nicknames of baseball, I guess. And, uh, you know, Cepeda was named the Bull. And there's a few other guys. Uh, Watson, I think, uh, was the bull, and then there was the first baseman from uh, uh, Chicago, went to San Diego, that, uh, that, that was the bull, but, uh, you know, most people call me bull instead of Greg, so, you know, it's something that stayed with me. Very good. So, uh, we do a little uh, little thing on the, on the show, especially uh, our live shows with some trivia question, so if you guys want to uh, listen up. Um, we got some great uh, prizes, some autographed uh, Greg Luzinski photos. Um, so if you guys want to pay close attention, the first arm that goes up, uh, generally that's uh, that's the one we're gonna we're gonna take. I'm sure my wife's arm will go up really fast because <laughs> she likes my pictures. Did you hear not, me, Jane? She's no, not. No, not paying you're not paying attention. It's like everyone. Oh. Uh. <laughs> All right. Johnny, so, you ready? Yeah, so we'll start off with an easy one. Um, how many times was Greg Lozinski an all-star? And no Googling. Yeah, because we got cheaters right up here. <laughs> Fan Ghoul, Fan Ghoul's already on the phone. Four. There you, you got go. that right. It's a winner. It's a winner. I started off easy. There's a couple hard ones here, so uh, we'll have to get you uh, experienced people uh, in uh, trivia ready. You want to yeah. throw another one out there? We'll throw another one out here. All right. All right. We got uh, here. Here's a tough one. Uh, May 16th, 1972. Greg Lozinski hit a ball off the uh, Liberty Bell in center field. Who did he hit the home run off? Sean, you don't know this. Who's the pitcher? Oh. We hear it every week, every other week on the, the bull show. Come on. He's, he's dropping a notch down. He's your buddy. He wants his red tickets back. <laughs> hey, Ken, you don't know this either? I, I, I'm sorry. Can you come back and change? I don't know this. He's a question. Who was the pitcher that Greg Lozinski hit the, the uh, home run off the Liberty Bell? Thank you. This, what? Play, play, for, play for the Cubs. <laughs> Nobody knows maybe, this? Maybe, maybe it maybe, uh, has something to do with an owl. The Cubs. The owl goes, whoo. There you go. We got, we got a winner. Don't work close. Burt, Burt, who? The Wi-Fi, I guess, is a little slow in here. I guess that's why nobody can get it. He stumped him on that one, huh? Burt, who? Huh? Yeah, Burt, who? Knuckle curveball uh, in the vet. We lost that game. I think uh, Rick Monday, I think, hit three home runs that game. Yeah. But uh, we got beat bad. And uh, fortunately, I, for myself, uh, I hit the ball off the Liberty Bell. Now, do you think that was one of your furthest home runs? Well, one of them, that was probably one of the furthest ones I hit in Veterans Stadium. Uh, I'd still say it went further than Stargill's went down the exit because uh, the, it was stopped by the Liberty Bell. And, uh, <laughs> You know, I've I, I, I've had a couple other stadiums. I was I hit the I think the second furthest in the Astrodome. I uh, hit the furthest, and it's it's ironic that in Pittsburgh in Three Rivers Stadium I hit the furthest off of uh, off of uh, Donnie Robinson over the scoreboard in left field. And uh, it's funny because I see Donnie now and then, and we talk about it. And uh, he, he actually I hit a curveball and. Uh, was kind of surprised how far it went because it wasn't uh, uh, 
conducive night to say hitting a baseball. You know, it was a cool night, but uh, uh, we, he laughs about it and I giggle about it. But I, you know, it's kind of neat uh, to talk about things like that with uh, guys you faced in the big leagues. And he uh, he was a good pitcher. I mean, I'm, I got him one night and he'd get me the next time. So uh, it, it all evens up. So let's go over a few things here, so uh, we can uh, we can we can get some winners out there for the trivia questions. Four-time All-Star, we had a winner, right? Yes, we did. He's a 1980 World Series champion, right? 1978 Roberto Clemente Award winner, right? National League RBI leader in 1975. You guys are remembering all this, right? Because it's going to come up. I'm telling you. Phillies Wall of Fame, 1998. The years that he played with the Phillies from 1970 to 1980. And then he moved over to the White Sox, 81 to 84, retired as a White Sox, but always a Philly in our hearts, right? Always. Well, let, let me say something about that. At that time, retirement was, wasn't as big as it is now. You know, now players kind of make a big deal of it. They want a one-day contract and, and things, of, things of that nature. And uh, back in 1984, when I did retire, uh, that, wasn't, uh, that wasn't the case. You just uh, took your uniform off and went to the microphone and said, you know, I'm finished. Uh, you know, I'll, I'm going to stay home with the kids and uh, watch them grow up. So it was a lot different. But nowadays, they, they all want to retire and have a day for themselves. Uh, the game's changed. Let's face it, guys. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a different ball game than it was, uh, well, we, what, 40 years ago when, I, when you know, I was playing? Couple more uh, little tidbits. Major League debut, September 9th, 1970. Who in here remembers that? You got anybody in here old enough to remember that? We got a young lady back there pointing to somebody. I'm having trouble remembering that. <laughs> that, that. That was one of my trivia questions. That's all right. We'll get a, we'll, part of it. We'll get another one. They're not going to remember. They won't. They're busy eating and drinking, which is good. Exactly. Which is good. <laughs> We went over that a little bit ago, but uh, a sports writer by the name of Bill Conlon gave that to me uh, after a workout I did uh, after, in 1968 when I was signed, uh, drafted by the Phillies. I think I was uh, like 11th in the country. That uh, kind of surprised me a little bit, but uh, I took another trivia question away from it. But, uh, you know, it stayed with me. The, the nickname stayed with me. I, 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 let me tell you a little story about 1968, if you don't mind. Um, I had a chance, well, I'm not going to say this either, but uh, because that's another <laughs> trivia question. But, uh, and, and, in 1968, uh, the Yankees had called me and said that uh, the, the draft was between a catcher and myself. See, in high school, I caught a lot. So uh, there was a chance that when I was drafted, I'd either be a catcher or a first baseman. So the Yankees had called me and uh, said, be, be prepared. Uh, the press may be calling you here shortly because uh, we still haven't made our mind up between you and Thurman Munson. So Thurman Munson at that time was a catcher and he was at uh, Kent State. And they ended up drafting, obviously, they, uh, uh, Munson. And they called me back and said the reason they took Munson is because he had four years or three more, three years of college experience, and I was coming out of high school, and they felt that he'd be with the Yankees, you know, a lot quicker than, than I would. So the, they, they did take uh, Thurman Munson. So if that answers part of your question, I guess that's good. That's okay. Well, I, I was a first baseman uh, my whole career in the minor leagues, and uh, what happened is uh, – Recall to uh, Philadelphia and uh, people, uh, I don't know if they remember Darren Johnson, but Darren Johnson had come off uh, three 30-year home runs a year, a year uh, for the Phillies, and he was first baseman. They had moved him to third base to play a little bit of third base, and he couldn't play there, and they moved him to the outfield. So eventually they said it would be easier for me to go to left field, so I ended up 
in left field, but I was a first baseman my whole career in the minor leagues. So ended up back there at all. How much of an adjustment was that? Well, it was it was a big adjustment, obviously. But uh, Paul Owens uh, was the general manager, and I was ready to go to spring training, not spring training, but to winter ball. And it, they didn't want me to go to winter ball. They said uh, you'll you'll be fine at spring training. He said, uh, "Don't there's no pressure on you. You're gonna you're gonna play left field and hit fourth. You know, but there's no pressure." So, but I, but I enjoyed it. I had a good time. Uh, you know, there's a little star next to my name for defense that people probably will not believe, but I, I led my first year in, uh, in defense percentage-wise in left field, which I'm kind of proud of. Yeah, exactly. And, and like Larry Anderson tells you, if they didn't score the way they do now, you would have won the six football. Oh yeah, we we text back and forth while Larry's on the radio, and it's uh, kind of a neat thing. But uh, there's been a lot of official scoring that uh, uh, people are uh, questioning nowadays. There's a little bit that goes with it, I guess. Nowadays, uh, how hard the balls hit, they go by velo and things of, things of that nature, which is uh, hard, hard for me to understand, but. Uh, uh, he texted me one day out of uh, when we were in uh, Citizens Bank Park, and there were a couple of very, very questionable calls. And he said, "Oh, this," but he said, "You probably would have had more golden gold gloves than he did." Which, obviously, Larry knows that Larry and myself are really tight. So. Oh yeah. Now you, you guys had. Uh a couple of good teammates there with Smitty and, uh, and Dick Allen as well. Yeah. So, how, how were those uh, batting practices? You know, well, we, we had good batting practices. I think Dick Allen was probably uh, somebody that was not appreciated probably as well by the fans. Uh, when you talk to Dick and if you read his book and they're coming out with a, uh, a video uh, document, 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 yeah, document, yeah. About about Dick, he had some. I mean, people don't understand what he did. He was in Arkansas and he couldn't eat with the team. He couldn't right. sleep with the team. You know, there was action going on at that time, and and, and uh, everybody talks about uh, Robinson, but uh, uh, and, and and other 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 players. But you know, Dick was right in there with him, and uh, he's a, he was a great player. He was good for our team. I mean, I. I he was, he was a good teammate for me and a uh, good team, teammate for everybody that was there. Dick, Dick thing, but when it came to playing on the field, he was, uh, you know, as tough as nails. I mean, he, he, he loved the game and wanted to play hard. Exactly. Exactly. What, um, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, does, he have a, does he have a chance for the Hall? Oh, when you look at his numbers, he should be in the Hall of Fame. I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, I don't. I don't understand why he's not there, and I think. I think especially now, when when the Hall of Fame is putting people in there that I think that don't deserve it. I mean, you know, uh, you look at some of the numbers nowadays. And I, I. I mean, I have a, a, another guy on our team, Larry Bow, for instance. Why, why isn't he in the Hall of Fame? I mean, when you look at a lot of his his stats, I mean, he had over 2,000 hits. Um, Obviously, he was an ear that uh, Concepcion was there uh, that took a lot of gold gloves probably away from him. But uh, I don't think uh, Larry was appreciated for, for what he did at shortstop in the time he played. I'm not talking about today, but I'm talking about the time back in the day when he played. So uh, hopefully, hopefully someday he'll get there. Yeah, it's a different, yeah, different breed. You see. So he was, uh, Tatis was probably the other extreme. He's great. Great. Thanks for coming out tonight. You guys are awesome. Excuse me, I've been asked that question a lot. I heard there was a little silence when he said that. But uh, the ball never hit the wall. It went straight up, and I caught it, caught the ball, brought it back down, and threw it to second base. It hit the seam. Uh, right there at the, 
before second base, you know how we had the cutouts. You hit the seam and Sizemore missed it. If he doesn't miss it, you know, we're fine. You know, but obviously Paul Pryor and didn't really know this, that those umpires down the line have one call, that they call a ball fair or foul when it's in their jurisdiction. Other than that, when it goes off the wall or goes off a glove, if it would have gone off the wall, think about this. If it would have gone off the wall, where would it have gone? It would have gone back to the infield, towards the infield. It never went that way. You know, it went straight up, and, you know, and I caught it. But, you know, obviously uh, they said it was in play. And I, like I said, uh, when the ball hit the seam and Sizemore missed it, that was, that was a big play. And Boa came back, uh, what, two plays later with a tremendous play. And uh, with instant replay, you know, we're going to the World Series. So. Yeah. So uh, again, I want to I want to thank everybody for coming out. We've got some great sponsors on board tonight. I got chills up here with all this vodka. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I I don't know if I can make it through the rest of the show. But anyway, uh, you guys need to check them out. They're a local distillery. Uh, I don't want to call them small business, but I'm all about small business and supporting local. So, uh, you know, they're offering up free drinks. So if you're 21, I would take them up on it. Uh, we got them in the house. Their reps are here. Uh, I want to thank them. I want to thank State Farm Insurance. I want to thank Kimberg. I want to thank our guest. Um, you know, the bull does does this um, show of his own with Dan Baker on Mondays. Um, and, you know, he, he does a phenomenal job. And, and you know, we're, we're, we're probably, uh, what's the right word? I mean, we got these guys that played in our, in our world, you know, back in the 70s and 80s. You know, my, my pet peeve in life, who's going to replace these guys? You know, you're not going to get a Chase Utley to sit up here. You're not going to get a Jimmy Rollins to sit up here. You know, these guys are willing to come out and share stories, baseball stories. You know, they're, they're great individuals in the community. Um, you can come down to the ballpark and see the bull. You know, he'll take pictures with you, sign autographs. These are, these are the guys that we, you know, we really uh, thrive on. And I, and I just, you know... I'm old. I'm going to be 65 next month. You know what I mean? When, when generation of players recognize this, you know, when do they start to give back, um, you know, and start doing the things for the kids, you know, in the community and whatnot? You know, you try to get them to come out and do things, and, you know, they're not available. But here's a guy, you could call him on the spur of the moment, and he's there. Just give me, give me the address, and he's there. Huh. You know, you talk about, Carl talks about stories. I'm going to tell you a story. I know they're passing around a Larry Bow jersey. Well, Larry Bow was my uh, roommate for many years in the big leagues. We're in Houston. And he strikes out right-handed, and he just stands there in the batter's box. And uh, the on deck, I forget who was on deck, and Paul Owens was the manager at the time. And he yells to the on-deck circle, go get him, go get him. Well, I, I was in the hole, so I'm getting, getting ready to walk up the steps to the dugout. And he said, Paul Owens walks, he said, Bull, go get him. I'm out of this game for him. I was a strike. So I go up there and I try to go get him and he turns around and he doesn't want to leave. Now he's been standing there and the umpire's already throwing him out of the game. So finally I get him to go to the dugout. Well, I was in the on deck circle and in Houston, there's a long way to the clubhouse. Well, he broke every light bulb going up to the clubhouse. So the game ended, you see 30, 33 guys holding hands going up to the clubhouse. Well, we get back to the room and uh, knock on the door and the trainer says, uh, hey, Bull, can uh, you come? 
go downstairs for a little bit. I need to talk to your little buddy. So I said, okay, fine. So I was down there probably an hour or better. Finally, the trainer came down and says, you can go up and, and, and talk to, you know, go back to the room. So I go back to the room and I walk in the room. I said, yo, Bo. I said, man, that was an, over an hour talk. He says, man, you can't believe some of the stuff this guy asked me. I said, what's that? He asked me if I ever got so bad, I was in a slump that I thought about jumping. I said, you're kidding me. So guess what? Anytime we went on the road, we never got hired the second floor. <laughs> You know, that's Larry Boa. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's intense. That's for sure. I got to get him here and get on this show. You'd love him. Well, well, we're talking about Hall of Famers. I think he's a Hall of Famer. You know, I, I really do. So, you know, times back then you had roommates. Nowadays, you don't, you don't, you don't have a roommate. Yeah, they're all, you know, they're all and it was it was fun because you had some, you had some camaraderie camaraderie as far as the team goes when when you had a roommate. Exactly. You have a question. Wow. Well, the pitcher that I probably had the most success from from a home run standpoint was uh, Steve Renko from the Montreal Expos. He probably got me 0 and 2 quicker than any pitcher in the league, but he always I knew he'd always make a mistake with his breaking ball, and he did. I think I hit seven or eight home runs off of him in my career. Toughest pitcher, and it was another Hall of Famer. And uh, tell you a little story. When I first came to the big leagues, we were going on a road trip, and you have to pack your pack bats. How many bats you think you know? You know you'll need on that road trip. So the first stop was New York City, and we're playing the Mets, and uh, I looked. Uh, uh, on a list, and they have your pro probable pitchers for for the series, and it was Seaver, Kuzman, and Ryan. So I packed a few extra bats. But, uh, <laughs> obviously, that was a, a pretty good starting starting lineup. But uh, Tom Seaver, Hall of Famer, was probably the best uh, pitcher I'd say I, I faced. Only only because Seaver was the type of pitcher that he could win with his bad stuff as, as well as his good stuff, and. Uh, as far as going down on strikes, I think there's a guy that uh, I think he's from, I, I'm pretty sure he's from around here somewhere. But um, I don't know if you guys remember the Count of Montefusco, John Montefusco. Well, John used to irritate everybody because if he was playing, uh, say, Cincinnati, he'd say, well, I'm going to strike out Foster, Bench, and uh, uh, Griffey or whatever. Uh, 15 times total. We're, we're going to get them. We're, I'm going to have 15 strikeouts for the game. When we face them, he'd say, well, I'll get Luzinski and Schmidt for at least nine. <laughs> you know, but I, I struck out, I think, uh, against them 22 times in, in my big league career. And the, the, the one memorable moment I had is when uh, West, Westrom was managing the, uh, the Giants and uh, Montefusco was pitching at the vet. And uh, he was going to go get him. And so Westrom walks out to the mound, and this is before they put the gloves in front of their mouths and, and things of that nature. And Westrom was halfway to the mound, and uh, Montefusco yells out, just turn around and go back, I'm going to strike him out. And I end up hitting a double on the first pitch off the wall. And wet, by the time I got to second base, uh, Westrom was at the mound. <laughs> He beat me to the. He beat me to the. I went. He beat me to second, but he, at the mound, uh, and I hit a double off him. He was gone, and I, that's that's one of the things I remember. But he got me probably more than I got him. And well, you get even with them, and they get even with you. You know, you face them enough. Um, I think one of the unique things about baseball now is. And they changed a little bit with the divisions. They still play six, 16 games, I think, against, the, not, against each other, right? So that gives you a chance to make up ground in your division. You know, there were only two divisions, obviously, when we played. But, uh, you know, that, 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 that's, uh, that's very crucial, I think, in today's game of baseball as well as it was when I played. When you start going head-to-head, -head, you find out who's the best. Right, exactly. That's how you break it. Yep.
Let's do some trivia. All right. You guys, you guys awake out there? A little trivia time? All right, so uh, Greg has played 22 postseason games, 16 of them for the Phillies. How many home runs in the 23 games has he hit in the postseason? That's a tough one. I don't know if I know that. Don't ask me. You don't know you even stumped you? Nope. I don't know. I know I know I had a consecutive hitting streak, but all right, so Three to eight. Three to eight. Four. Four. Six, four. four. No. You're close, though. Six is close. Five. There you go. Five. Five. Winner. Here we go. Winner, winner. You were clutch in the, in, the, in the playoffs. Yeah, I think uh, obviously the playoffs are a lot different now because you got have, have a lot of, a lot of games. But uh, I, at one time I did have the longest hitting streaks in, in the playoffs. I think I had 13 games. But uh, again, like there's so many games now that they play because of divisional play and wild card division and things of that nature. We didn't have that. But, but I mean, you had a 310 bat average in, in, in the playoffs for the Phillies. You had an 18 games hit, hits out of the 16. Yeah, I had. Uh, yeah. Two, two game winning. <laughs> well, I think those probably were, you know, for me, uh, a couple big biggest hits I had in my career. I hit a, a two run homer against Houston in the first game of the playoffs. And I think everybody remembers uh, P. Rose when he went home and uh, the collision at home played against uh, Bochi. But it, uh, I was the guy that hit the double in the corner that. Uh, Kind of got, got pushed aside because of Pete's instinct to go home. Right. Oh, no, exactly. No, that was, that was you, do, you, uh, do you have an easy, easy trivia easy. question? You have an easy one. All right. Greg, Greg, Greg kind of already alluded to it, but uh, in uh, 1968, he was the first round pick. What was the overall pick that he was? Now, he, he already announced it, so this, this one's not hard. They're not listening. Yeah, Harry, it's hard to hear. It's hard, it's hard to hear. Hard to hear? Oh, sorry, sorry. I would think Fan Duel would get this because he's really close. <laughs> and he probably had a bet on it. <laughs> Nobody? I'll give you another one myself. Before I was number 19, what was my previous number? <laughs> right. It's retired. Yes. <laughs> you were the first one to get it retired. Yeah. All right, so we got a we got a fight and Phil's Redding Redding fight and Phil's rep in the house. So uh, he he's new he's new, but he's he, he's a baseball guy and uh, he's a big Pirates fan. So uh, any any good stories from uh, your Redding days? Anything you can share? Maybe he could take back to the office. Well. Speaking of the Pirates, uh, we did get beat in uh, the year I was there in uh, Reading by the Pirates in a playoff series. Andy Semenek was our manager. And uh, the one thing I do remember is I faced uh, Bruce Keeson, who uh, pitched uh, the playoff game there. And they counted the playoff game towards winning the batting title. So I had to get, uh, I had to get a hit or a couple hits in order to win the batting title that day. And everybody knows that uh, Bruce, Bruce Keeson was uh, obviously a very quality uh, big league pitcher. He pitched for Pittsburgh, and he was probably one of the youngest uh, to pitch for them in a World Series game. But uh, Bruce, who obviously has passed, but a good friend of mine, I coached with him in Kansas City, I, I ended up uh, getting a double against him. Uh, to win a batting crown, but uh, also we lost the game to a very good uh, Pirates uh, farm team at uh, three to two. So uh, it, 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 there was a lot of memories from Reading. I, for me, Reading was a great, great baseball town. I, I enjoyed it and uh, got beat by uh, the, the Pittsburgh Pirates out of Waterbury, Connecticut. Here you go. A little baseball history there. Hey, uh, real quick, um, how's the uh, raffle baskets over there, Sue? 
You need tickets. Uh-oh. I've heard, we, we've heard that before. The basket needs to everybody get their two free tickets. If not, go see Sue. And if you'd like to buy extras, she's got them for sale. Um, and if you'd like to buy her a beer, I'm sure she'll take that too. <laughs> Norway, please. Shawnee, any any questions for our guest? I'm sure you you you've got some baseball knowledge digging deep. Lauren, go over there with the mic with uh, Mr. Sean. Well, obviously, Nolan Ryan, another Hall of Fame pitcher. And uh, let me just say this before I answer that question. At that time, he threw, you know, 99 mile an hour according to the Houston scoreboard. So all these all these hitters now that look at these pitchers and go, oh, this guy's throwing 95, this guy's throwing 99. We faced those pitchers 40 years ago. But uh, Nolan Ryan, you know, the, the, the key thing, I think, against uh, Ryan was the bunt. You know, Greg Gross never dropped a bunt. He was a great pinch hitter for us, but I'd never seen him bunt before in his life. And he, he, he obviously, he played at Houston at one time, and he was playing against uh, the Astros that he was, he was signed by, but he dropped that bunt. And, and the, the other big play was when you go back, Bob Boone hit a base hit up the middle. And could have been, you know, Nolan kind of missed it, it could, have, it could have gone from a base hit into a double play, but because it went, he got it by the pitcher, it went in center field for a base hit, which was really, really big for us, you know. And, and Ryan, you know, obviously was, was a great pitcher, but, uh, you know, Pete used to come back to the dugout. And uh, after Pete come back to the dugout, and I don't know if I can say this, but he used to always go, he ain't got shit, you know. He ain't thrown hard. You look up at the scoreboard and you go, whoa. But you go to the, you know, you go to the batter's box and it's, and it's a little different story. Everybody, I'll just say this, everybody sees a fastball a little bit different than the next guy. If, if you're swinging the bat good, you're seeing it a whole lot better. So that, that 99 or whatever he's throwing, that 95 doesn't look like that to you. But if you're struggling a little bit, then it looks like 105. You know, it, it's it's a whole whole different thing. But uh, there were a couple of plays, like you, I said, that game. You know, the the the, the, the base hit by Booney and the, the bump by Greg Gross that uh, kind kind of been ignited our offense and uh, went on. You, you know, went on to uh, win that series. You know, every game except the first game was extra innings. You know, and and the, they were all nail biters. And our club didn't really hit well in Houston. If you look back, we used to get good pitch games like in the 70s, late 70s, and we didn't score runs there. So when, trust me, when Ryan got ahead of us, it, you know, it was kind of like, whoa, you know. But, you know, we turned it around and scored some runs that game and went on to win the World Series. So, great moment. Yeah, the Greg Rose, Greg Rose was, uh, was big to you. Well, nobody expected it. Right. Okay, speak loud. <laughs> <laughs> Well, your, your question is probably a lot longer than my answer. First of all, I'm 70 years old, and I don't know how you expected me to hear all that. Uh, okay, influence as far as playing a game of baseball. I, I, 
Ashburn, Harry Callis. Oh, they're Richie Ashburn, Harry Callis were outstanding, and I was offered because uh, the Ashburn had passed, but I was offered the hitting, Philly's hitting coach job, which I turned down because of Richie Ashburn. Uh, Richie wanted me to always be a coach and wanted me to be a hitting coach. He said because I was the one guy that had the right attitude towards the approach to hitting because I used to always hit off a fastball. I, I, I talked to Richie a lot about it and talked about hit off the fastball and adjust to a breaking ball. All these people that say they sit on pitches, like they're sitting on a, a off-speed changeup or a curveball, it's all bull crap. If you're not ready for a fastball, you're not going to be ready for a changeup or you're not going to be ready, re ready for a curveball. The hardest thing about hitting that you have to get to, through a hitter's mind, and you can even watch it now on TV, if you're not ready for a fastball to hit a fastball, you're not going to hit. You're going to fall it off. Hoskins is now in an 0 for 34 or 35 slump, which is unheard of. You know what? He, he pulls all his hard hit balls foul. You know why? Because he, he doesn't get to a position to see the pitch. If he got to a better position to see the pitch, he wouldn't do that. But he jumps out there and everything's going foul. So. You know, I'm not saying hitting's easy. I, I, I made a lot of mistakes. I struck out a lot of times, but th these guys are making, I think they make it a lot more difficult than it is. I think, you know, the word anal analytics, they analyze the game a little bit too much. I think they need, I think that uh, it's hard enough game to play as a pitcher, fielder or hitter. Hardest thing in sports, I think, is hitting a, a baseball with a round bat, a round ball with a round bat, you know, and then hitting it hard. But, uh, you know, when you start throwing things between, yeah, six inches between the ears, like uh, John has said, it makes it a lot tougher, you know. I, but uh, Richie Ashburn was a great player, you know. Uh, I remember watching him in Chicago when he got traded to Chicago uh, when I was growing up. So uh, he was a great player. And I think him and Harry Callis was probably one of the best announcing duels uh, you'll see in the game of baseball. Yeah, we missed them a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Good Tug McGraw stories. I don't, I don't know if you all remember on uh, St. Patty's Day, uh, before they wore the green hats and the, the green shirts, Tug McGraw went to the mound in Clearwater. He unzipped his pants and threw his pants down to the ground on the mound and he was all wearing all green underwear. And you know, ever since that day, they started wearing green hats and green jerseys and different things. So Tug changed the whole dynamics of the Phillies in spring training on St. Pat Patty's Day. What better place to be? Dagwood's Pub with a Tug McGraw story, right? <laughs> exactly. He would, he would appreciate it. So lift, lift your glass, lift your bottle. Here's, here's the Tug and a great story. Absolutely. He's smiling right now. You got it. Hey, let's uh, let's reel it in a little bit. Modern day baseball, 2021. What uh, is there a player that you uh, you have your eyes on? Is there somebody that you really admire as a well, I think player? I think when you look at shortstops nowadays, there's a lot of them. I think Tatis Jr. is uh, probably one of the best players, obviously in the league. Uh, he covers ground. He's got a great arm, and he hits. You know, he he, he hits for average. And, and uh, hits a lot of home runs. So, you know, I, I think the White Sox may, might be kicking themselves in the butt because uh, yeah. they they traded uh, Shields yeah. and got Shields. yeah from uh, San Diego and, and uh, sent Tatis to uh, San Diego. So, uh, you know, they, they're probably well. Obviously, they got a pretty good shortstop in Anderson, but uh, right. having that combination, say uh, Tatis and Anderson. If, a second and uh, short would have been uh, 
a hell of a combination, but he, he, he's just a great player. I mean, you think about it. Uh, here was a guy that was supposed to be hurt this season, right. and, and he leads what's he got, 21 home runs in the, the National League and leads the league. Uh, I, yeah, I, he, he's just a great player that uh, obviously family – uh, family baseball, uh, right. you know, but, right now. a lot of them play in the big leagues, but uh, I, I don't know. It just it's just amazing to me that these shortstops nowadays uh, 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 play with uh, the power they did. Uh, I think a lot of this started though. When you look at Jeter, I mean, Jeter was probably one of the best players you're going to see at shortstop right. yeah. for, for a long, long time. Yeah. And, Great, great career, and now he's uh, what president of the the Miami or Marlins. Miami Marlins, yeah. So uh, there's a, there's a lot of great great players out there, but I think Tatis is probably for me one of the guys that I really enjoy. I, I really enjoy watching because you don't you don't really know what to expect. You don't know expect a, a double in a gap or a base hit or the ball going 470 feet. Yeah, he's exciting. Yeah, he's an exciting player. Now, how, would, how do you think you would be, uh, fare nowadays with, well, there's, with, with all the analytics like you're saying? You know. There's no question that uh, Citizens Bank Park is uh, probably a, without a doubt a hitter's ballpark. And uh, when you look at the, you know, the vet, they, they used to have the low wall. And then they, after the first year in 71, because they had so many balls bouncing over the walls that, that, that hurt, hurt you uh, on a double and a guy on base, they, they raised the wall. And uh, you, you just look at the dimensions of uh, Citizens Bank Park. Uh, I talked to Schmidt about home runs not too long ago. We were talking about right field home runs. And when you look right now at Citizens Bank Park and you compare it to Veteran Stadium, there's no question you'd like to hit Citizens Bank Park. I, I, we were talking about right. I said, Schmitty, you hit a lot more home runs than I did. You hit over 500 home runs. I said I was only at 307, but I don't remember hitting many home runs to right field. He says, either do I. He says, but nowadays, and you hear Schmitty talk about it all the time, on Sunday hitting the ball to right field, hitting the ball through the hole, you know, the gaps that they give you. So you know that uh, obviously this ballpark and uh, they're playing and now the ball carries a lot better. And I think the bats with the new lacquers, we had we had two bat companies. Now they probably have 17. Uh, we had one lacquer. You, I remember when Pete Rose went to Mizuno, uh, they had to approve the lacquer that the Mizuno bats had, had on them. This is way back when, in, uh, what, 7, 1979. And we could only use one lacquer from uh, Adirondack and Hill Ridge and Bradsby. Now, now that with the maple wood and the different woods they have, they lacquer them up. They're hard bats. You know, the the reason you see uh, bats explode now is because there's really no way to detect a uh, middle. Uh, the bat's so hard a crack in the middle. They say in order to Protect that you'd have to X-ray them after every hit bat, and, wow. and they're not going to do that. So every now and then you see a bat explode. But you know, it, it, it's it's modern day baseball. New balls, wound tight. Uh, we were talking about sticky stuff uh, early early in the show, and the reason they do that is because the seams are so flat. These pitchers can't grip the ball. So you, you, can you imagine in colder weather? What are they going to do if they can't feel the ball? You know, guys have been hit a lot now. What's going to What's going to happen with control when they can't feel it? Exactly. You know, like I said, as a hitter, you can't let that bother you. If you, you know, there, there, there's too many crippled pitches you can hit in the game of baseball that that you that hitters fall off or don't center. So uh, I, I don't I don't think there's as personally. I don't think there's as many natural pure hitters nowadays. When you look at the averages, look on Sunday. It goes from three something, then it goes to 290. That never used to happen when I played. There was all 300 hitters there. You know, there are better hitters. I think they're uh, more training them to be power hitters. Well, obviously, with the upswing now, it's a lot different than how we were trained. Hit down through the ball to get the backspin and, fin and finish high. But nowadays they got that upper gut, up, uppercut 
and uh, you know they, they try to hit the ball to the ballpark. But the the games the games different. You know how many games have you guys watched? You guys are old timers. You guys go back there. You watch some old games. We don't move runners. We don't we don't do things like that. We don't give ourselves up in situations where we should. And, and, it, and when it comes down to the end of the game, it hurts you. What's wrong with putting a run up every game? And all of a sudden, at the end of the game, you have nine. Right. Yeah, I mean, Gerard, Gerard has been trying to do that a little bit with, with the team, you know, obviously with all the injuries that they have. Yeah. You know, he's trying to do a little well, bit. I think he needs and... probably to be a little more forceful and, do, and, and, and get him to do these things. I think they they, they look down there for – I don't understand this in the game of baseball. We watch our guys tonight. They'll have two strikes on them, and they'll look down at third base coach. Like, yeah. what signs out? What do you mean, what signs out? Uh, uh, hit the ball. Just make contact. You know, uh, it, it, it baffles me. I mean, don't do you understand the game? They're worried about, what's that called, rock, scissors, uh, paper, rock, scissors. So uh, here, here we are, Dagwood's Pub. I want to again, I want to thank our guests. The stories have been great. The conversation's phenomenal. Talking baseball history to modern day. You guys have been great for coming out. Uh, Greg the Bull Luzinski, come on. Again, I want to I want to thank uh, Ed and Nikki from the owners here at Dagwood's Pub for uh, for providing us this uh, great backdrop. Um, we've got uh, City Distilling on board with us tonight. Uh, go check out those folks; they're local. Um, I, I'm not local, but I'm going to go check them out because they got they got some good things. So uh, we need to we need to put them at at the top. So. Um, again, you really think this is a popsicle? <laughs> uh, it doesn't taste like. It. Oh yeah, it's a rocket one. Yeah. <laughs> I think they got a winner there. Yeah. I think so. I think that's a home run, Bull. But again, I want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, put it on your uh, July calendar. We got a we got another great baseball guy coming out. Tommy Green will be here. Um, another guy with great stories. So we'll be here. We hope you'll be here. Lauren, have I missed anything? Come on, Lauren. July 14th. There you go. What did I say? I did. I did. Sorry about that. July 14th. Mark your calendars. But uh, again, I want to thank everybody for coming out. I hope you enjoy. Stick around. We're going to pull the raffle winners at the end of the first quarter of the Sixers win tonight. <laughs> it's Sixers, Sixers party right after the show here. Right. Mr. FanDuel over there. He just, he just. Is your dad saying? He was here five minutes and he made it ugly for me. <laughs> There's always one in the crowd. He's got to have his money on the Hawks. That's all I can say. But anyway, guys, again, thank you uh, to the Bull. He's going to hang out for a little bit. So if you guys want to take some pictures, maybe grab an autograph. He's, he's accessible. You. Mondays with Dan Baker at the Hard Rock Cafe down in Center City, Philadelphia. He's there from 6 to 7. He brings in some, some really cool Philly legends. So go see him there. Uh, John, you got anything else to add before we put a wrap on it? I'm just excited, you know, for everybody that came out here tonight. We thank you, everybody. Uh, it was a big crowd here. And uh, go Sixers later on. And thanks, you got that right. Go Sixers. Thank you, Greg, for coming out. Really appreciate thank you. Uh, great hour. It goes always too goes fast. fast. It's always too fast. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, yeah. Tyler. Tyler O'Brien. Tyler, you need to put your Tyler. Somebody wake Tyler up. Be sleep. Tyler, wake up. Thanks for coming, buddy. No problem. I appreciate it. <laughs> Guys, everybody on Facebook, everybody here at Dagwoods. I, I again, I can't thank you all enough. And uh, we'll be we'll be back next Wednesday night at six thirty. Let's give it up one last time for the bull. Thank you. Thank you. Alright guys. That's a wrap, Bull. Got it.